D'accord, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you first. Good morning and welcome to the press conference for The Apprentice in competition at the 77th Festival du Film de Cannes. It's a pleasure to introduce so many of the film's makers with us. Uh, there are a number of questions, so I'm going to be very brief in my introductions. I'll start at the other end of the table with producer Daniel Beckerman, who's given us such films as The Witch or The Witch. <laughs> Next to him, Jacob Jarek. He also produced Ali Abbasi's first feature, Shelley, as well as Ali's 2022 competition entry, Holy Spider. Producer Jacob Jarek. Next to me, producer Louis Tisney. This is his third time in Cannes after Ali Abbasi's second feature, Borders, and Leoto Montagna, which was in competition two years ago. Louis Tisney. <laughs> Next to him, Amy Baer, executive producer and an originating producer. Her other credits include Jerry and Marge Go Large, Brian Banks, and Mary Shelley. IMDb relates that the films she supervised and produced have collectively taken in over $2 billion, <laughs> but it doesn't mention if those are real dollars or Donald Where's that Trump money, dollars. Amy? <laughs> Amy Bear. Next to her, the scriptwriter and producer, Gabe Sherman. Gabe's the author of the best-selling biography of Roger Ailes, The Loudest Voice. He also produced the TV series based on his book. Gabe Sherman. At the other end, uh, in the role of Fred Trump, we've seen in him such movies as Tenet and Blackberry and the series Big Little Lies, Martin Donovan. <laughs> Maria Bakalova is the Oscar-nominated actress from the <laughs> Borat. Her performance. Her performance also earned her nominations at the BAFTAs, Golden Globes, Critic Choice Awards, Screen Actors Guild, and dozen of other nominations. In the role of Ivana Trump, Maria Bakalova. <laughs> Sebastian Stan is the actor we know from the Marvel Universe. We've also seen him in Steven Soderbergh's Lucky Logan and Tonya Har as Tonya Harding's husband in the I, Tonya, he took the Best Actor Prize in Berlin this year in the role of Donald Trump, Sebastian Stan. It was for a different role, but, but thank you. A different man, September 20th. <laughs> and this is his third film in official selection. After Border, which won uh, the Prix en Certain Regard in 2018, the film was nominated for an Oscar for Best Makeup and Hair, which may have been useful in preparing for Donald Trump. <laughs> He also brought us Holy Spider two years ago, which earned its actress, Zahra Amir Ebrahimi, Best Actress, and was nominated for an Academy Award. He also directed the final episodes of The Last of Us, producer and director, Ali Abbasi. <laughs> Amy, you mentioned that you had a st yes. statement. Yes, you're going to read something for me. Yeah. Our esteemed colleague. Esteemed colleague, <laughs> who's uh, a method actor, <laughs> doesn't want to leave his engagements. So this is uh, a message from Jeremy Strong. You know, I. <laughs> yes. He he really wanted to be here, obviously, but he is, as I said, committed to every single thing he does. And you know, now his show on Broadway is a fantastic show. 
and uh, he cannot simply leave the work. And I'm going to read it in my broken English, and uh, if I have uh, grammatical mistakes, you correct me. <laughs> so here it goes. I deeply wish I could... This is great because like, really, they're really big. <laughs> <laughs> I deeply wish I could be there with you right now, but I'm on stage in New York doing Henrik Ibsen's play, An Enemy of the People. Enemy of the people is a phrase that has been used by Stalin, by Mao, by Goebbels, and most recently by Donald Trump when he denounces the free press and called CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, New York Times, the fake news media, an enemy of the people. <clears throat> We're living in a world where truth is under assault, and in America, that assault on truth in many ways began in the malevolent paralysis of Donald Trump apprenticeship under Roy Cohn. Cohn was called an assault specialist by the National Law Journal, and this perilous moment in history we are, at this perilous moment in history, we are experiencing Roy Cohn's long, dark shadow. His legacy of lies, of outright denialism, of manipulation, of flagrant disregard for truth has reached a terrible fruitation. Ali Abbasi, wrongly, wrongly written, but <laughs> you know. Ali Abbasi has made a monster movie where one gets the other. It's an attempt to understand in the words of the 11th century Persian poet Omar Khayyam, how yesterday this day's madness did prepare. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. It doesn't get any better than that. We have so many questions, we're going to start on the right side. Obviously, we are completely nonpartisan, so, you know, that's Jeremy's own soul, uh, <laughs> you know, at his own discretion. Uh, Rodrigo Fonseca from Correio da Manhã, Rio de Janeiro. Question to Sebastian, two questions, in fact. I would like to hear you about the preparation for the role. And the second question, I don't know if you could use the word honor in related to Trump, but do you believe that he has a code of honor? What is, called, is this code? Uh, <clears throat> preparation, right? Um, well, it's, it was sort of a 24-7 kind of immersion process of basically, uh, I guess, living with him to some extent uh, in my headphones and on my phone and YouTube and everywhere I was going and walking, whatever I was doing, if I was in the bathroom, I was listening to him. Uh, so, uh, it, I don't know how else to do it, you know, except, uh, a hundred percent. And that's what I tried to do in the limited time that we had. And, um, you know, he, he is, uh, a human being like everybody else. So, uh, I guess we all have certain codes and certain, um, principles. It just depends on what they are. I guess it's relative to everybody. Thank you. Question on the other side. Maria Zdravey, Tuk. I'm from Bulgaria, Maria's uh, home country. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask her, uh, it's your second Trump movie. Uh, what was the feeling to be Ivana for the film uh, and you to become the main East European in Hollywood? How do you feel? Um. Thank you so much for those kind words. Um, I, I, I don't know how I'm feeling. I'm just feeling honored to be able to work and to work with great people, having legends like Ali and Sebastian and Martin and everybody on this table. It's just a privilege and an honor, and I just hope to do my best. I feel grateful to have a chance to portray a character like Ivana because the more I got to know about her, the more I fell in love with her. Um, she's been a woman that has been way too much ahead of her time, and it's inspiring to see somebody pursuing their dreams, ambitions, driven by the idea of, I don't know, just achieving it. And I just got inspired. I honestly got inspired, and I think she has been a legend. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm on the right side. Um, hi, I'm Jada Yuan. I write for the Washington Post. Um, and this question is for Sebastian and Ali. 
Um, what did you learn about Donald Trump uh, while making this movie that you think we can relate to the Trump that we know today? And can you also talk about the release schedule during the election and sort of what hope you have for the impact the film would have? <laughs> what did we learn? What did we? What did, what did you learn? <laughs> it's up, I think that's up to you guys, you know, to see the movie. I think that's the 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 hope we have is that people watch the film, because I always feel like there there is always something to learn. And and I think for me, you know, as an actor and standing next to this brave artist that I respect and I will follow wherever he goes, with all these people that had enough balls to do this project. You know, that's what we have to do. We have to kind of take take on things that are risky and perhaps uncomfortable to talk about. But, you know, I think it's important that we do um, because, like Ali said last night, it, it's in our face every day. And, and I think we need to have a perspective um, or we need to just at least confront one another, hopefully in a peaceful way, about, you know, what, what is happening and what we're seeing. Um, and um, I think there's a lot to learn from the film. Yeah, and we have a uh, promotional event coming up called US Election. It's gonna help uh, us uh, with the movie. Uh, so we're, we're hoping very much that it can come out. You know, uh, if I'm remembering right, the, the second debate's gonna be in September 15th, something like that. So that's a good release date for us, I would say. Fantastic. On the right. And on the left, sorry. Yeah. Jeffrey, yeah. 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 Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask particularly Gabe and Ali about the an amazing, for me, emotional moment when uh, having known about Roy Cohn, a good part, part of my life, and uh, believing and understanding he's one of the most reprehensible human beings of the 20th century, arguably. And I just thought the, uh, the movie does an amazing thing by actually making you feel sorry for him, empathy. And I was just, when Trump basically screws him over, and I uh, was just wondering if you had sort of tried to build to that emotional moment, whether that was a key strategy on your part. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, and uh, yeah, to some extent, I think when uh, I originally was having the idea for the script and, and doing the, the research that um, formed the foundation of the script, there were sort of several big hinge points in the film. And um, one definitely was when um, Donald kicks Roy's um, former lover, Russell, out of the hotel um, and sends him the bill for the, for the bill, which is a true, which is a true anecdote. And, um, I just felt that was so encapsulating of the way Donald is so one way. You know, he, he talks about loyalty, but it's, it's only a one way street with him. And so um, I wanted the movie to, to build to one of those moments because if you can feel sympathy and empathy for Roy, who did so much damage and has continued to do damage to democracy and truth and the world we live in, it says something about Donald as well. So um, that was the idea. You know, uh, there was this very uh, famous press conference with a compatriot of mine, Lars Trier here, <laughs> some years ago. <laughs> and he was asked what he thought of. Somehow he ended up saying that he understands Adolf Hitler. And then it got worse and it got worse and you know, <laughs> and nobody could save him. But there is some truth to that, you know, in as so far that these are all human beings, the most despicable monster you can think of, the, the most reprehensible person in, in history also liked the dog or uh, fell for someone or was nice to somebody at some point, you know? And I think that uh, th for me, this is, a, if there is an ideology for the movie, it's a humanist ideology. It is about uh, taking these people who are icons, who are, are hated, loved, uh, 
to down to earth and and sort of deconstructing that mythological uh, image into earthly human beings. Uh, with that comes understanding. With that comes uh, sympathy. That doesn't necessarily mean you forgive everything they did, but it comes understanding and sympathy. And I think that is, you know, if there is a cathartic uh, m mission for a movie, that would be it, I think. <clears throat> Fantastic, thank you. Yes, in the front. Hi, Gunnar Alim from Sweden. I, <clears throat> it's all over the news today that the Trump organization is threatening with a lawsuit against the film. Could anyone sort of comment on that? I mean, it's with you. You're the news. I'm the filmmaker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you scared of that? I mean, everybody talks about uh, him suing a lot of people. They don't talk about his success rate, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> We encourage them to actually see the film. Clearly, they haven't yet. And also, I think it, it is, um, if I was him, I would be sitting in uh, New Jersey, Florida, or wherever he is now, or New York, um, and I would be thinking, oh, this like crazy Iranian guy and some like liberal cunts in Cannes, they gathered and they, they did this movie and it's like fucked up and you know, it's like, you know, demeaning and it's a conspiracy. But uh, as you say, I really think that, I don't necessarily think that this is a movie that, you know, he would dislike. I don't necessarily think he would like it. I think that he, I think he would be surprised, you know? And I, you know, like I said before, like I would be happy, I would offer him to, go and meet him wherever he wants and, and talk about the context of the movie, have a screening and have a chat afterwards, you know, if, if that's uh, interesting for anyone, you know, <laughs> of Trump campaign people here. <laughs> Question on the, yep. at the back on the left. Uh, Steve Weintraub, Collider. Uh, Ali, I'm curious, I'm fascinated by the editing process and I'm curious how this film changed in the editing room in ways you didn't expect going in. Well, thank you for the question. Um, you know, uh, as a filmmaker, I am really a representative of a team. You know, I know it's a banal thing to say, but I am, you know, and I'm happy that you guys think that everything on the movie is me. But, you know, in reality, a lot of that and a lot of the sort of the, the, the thought process, a lot of the rhythm, a lot of the really important decisions are made in editing. Um, I think, you know, I've had the, you know, as someone like, in a way, like if you grow up chubby and, and you know, then you lose weight and then, you know, every time you think about like eating food, you're like, okay, I was a chubby teenager, I have to eat less. It's like, I've been hearing so much that I make like slow movies with deliberate pacing. And I was like, <laughs> now I'm gonna make a fucking fast movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I have to. And, and I think it's in the nature of this movie, in the manic nature of this character and this world and universe, it has to have that manic pace. It has to feel short, hopefully. Um, so it, w it was a lot of that, a lot of the music choices, uh, a lot of those moments were cre created in the edit because the way we worked on set was, you know, we didn't want to necessarily commit to a certain specific timing or certain specific way of doing things. We rather wanted to do a five different versions with. <laughs> and and, and that, that, that means that you get into those, uh, uh, you know, with those decisions and make them in the editing. So that was an extremely, extremely important. And here I appeal to all the producers and financiers out there, the silent movie era is over. Nobody is editing movie in 12 weeks anymore. Stop putting that in budget start at 30, 35, and then we can talk. <laughs> I don't think you had 35 weeks, though. But actually, there's one thing we should mention, which is, you want to talk about Olivia and Olivier? We had two editors, because the way that um, Ali and Casper were shooting, that was probably double or three times the amount of footage that you normally have. Um, so Olivia, who is um, Ali's editor since, since Shelley, right, since the beginning, 
Um, then we added another editor, um, Olivier Buguecouté, um, who works with Joachim Trier, and, and it was a beautiful collaboration. Yeah, because in a way, like, the, what I love to do in the editing is, is like a debate, you know, and, and therefore I think, bless you, um, I think it's, uh, it's a good idea to have more than two people, you know, because then you can discuss ideas and then you can sort of, uh, you know, have a debate instead of being about taste. I think that's the most important thing for me. I don't, I try to get out of my own taste when I make movies. <coughs> Thank you. On the left. Oh, Hi, uh, Shirin Sharif from BBC World Service. Uh, congratulations on the movie, a great film. And uh, Sebastian, it was amazing performance. Uh, my question is for Ali. Uh, so it's your first English uh, feature film. Uh, and most of the stories before were linked to what we say is your uh, concerns that came with you from your background. Uh, Sorry, my what? Concerns, like... Concerns, yeah. 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 Uh, issues that you are interested to actually expose or to highlight from your country, from your previous uh, life or whatever. But with this film, uh, if, we, if we see it separately by itself, it's a completely different strategy. In one of your interviews after the film, you said, I did this film to uh, be closer to the present, to what is happening now. And you linked this film to the current war in Ukraine and current war in Gaza. Um, so would this your, or can we read this as another way of linking the disasters and the wars we have now with uh, corruption in the American society that caused by that, or it's too deep breathing that it's overwhelming that your idea? It would be too metaphorical, I guess. Um, that would be too metaphorical. Thank you. Question on the left. Yeah. Oh. Um, Добрий день, Марія Бакалова. Аз Самора Скирібаєв, журналіст від Казахстан. Завершив сам університет в Болгарії. Зато вам багато рад вам дати відео Марія в такий фільм. Поздравлення за ролята. Now in English. Uh, my name is Zora Skiribaev. I'm really happy that uh, Maria Bakalova beautifully reprised such a role in uh, Ali Abbas's movie. And my question goes to her. Uh, so, uh, how did you get this role, first of all? How easy was it? And how, and if you could speak a little more uh, in detail about uh, being an Eastern European who made it in Hollywood, and whether you or other representatives uh, from this region get uh, typecasted today in the industry, or now this is slowly getting to an end. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Um, thank you. It's really nice to hear a language that you know. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to start. I have to say that the first time that I got the chance to read something about the script, the script I read in the same day, same hour, I think, uh, and I saw Ali Abbasi attached. He's going to be directing, and I've, I love his work. I love his work since Shelley, Border, Holy Spider, everything. You're such a visionary director, so I was like, I'm able to be auditioning as, m as many times as possible to be getting this role. And I remember I was shooting a movie in New York, and quickly, asked my hair and makeup um, people to put a little bit of a makeup, a little bit of a hairstyle, and try to get in the shoes of this lady that I didn't really know a lot about. And I took a few pictures, and I wasn't required to do something like a self-tape or anything at this point, but I just recorded something, improvised, and I asked my manager, can you please send this? Can you please send this? And she sent it, and then I started the auditioning process, and. It's been just wonderful to have a chance to collaborate while auditioning, because I remember you were guiding me and giving me different notes and directions and trying this and that, because it's important, especially playing a real human being, you want to play them with depth and dignity, of course, with good and bad sides, but you want to play the right person. So it was an auditioning process. I was lucky enough to have a chance to be a part of this auditioning process, because as you know, it's still, unfortunately, rare to get a chance to 
even audition if you're coming from that region of the world, from Eastern Europe. And that's my dream, to just bring more chances and opportunities for people like us, because I grew up not really recognizing myself on screen, and ever since this wild journey with me going through similarly like Ivana, to the United States, the land of freedom and opportunity happened. I just wish to shine light on people from my region of the world and try to bring chances and expand the collaboration between the Eastern and the Western side. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. So thank you to Ali, to Amy, to everybody here um, to have a chance to be here today. I'd like to ask the other, two other actors. There's so much visual material of the real characters on uh, YouTube everywhere. Is that a help or is it uh, limiting as an actor in preparing? Uh, uh, for me, it was a huge help because Fred's not a, it was, uh, uh, you know, he's not an iconic figure like Donald. And so I think most people wouldn't you know, wouldn't have known who he, who he was or what he looked like or what his mannerisms were, but they actually the production found a, um, a video of him accepting an award um, in New York City, and it's about a five minute speech, and I just played that over and over and over and over again and uh, picked up on his, on his rhythms and, you know, went from there. Stan. Yeah, I mean, I it, it was the Rona Barrett um, one hour or something interview that I found online, and and I watched that incessantly. I mean, but for me, it was kind of actually I had to distance myself from a lot of the stuff from today, and and really go back to and and that's we were lucky in the sense that. Um, <laughs> You, there's a lot out there to, to sort of see and watch and read and a lot of interviews that he gave in, the, in that time, um, you know, archives in New York Times and the New York Magazine and the first cover he got and all that. So it was a uh, huge help. Thank you. You know, it's also a, a uh, interesting time because it feels like, you know, these characters, they have like, four different lives, you know? Uh, I think that's what's interesting about the the man, the character, the legend, the politician, Donald Trump, is, you know, if you look at his developments in every decade, it's a different person. It's a different person. And, and you know, that's why I think uh, what uh, Sebastian has done, what Jeremy has done, Maria has done, uh, w you know, what Martin has done, it's so remarkable because it's like you have to, it's not as simple as, oh, you see a YouTube video and you say, oh, there's a guy, like, I'm doing my way. You have to pick that moment in time which fits to this moment in time where we're doing things. And you have to adapt that. And, you know, in your case, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really crazy because, you know, there are a million ways of doing this guy and uh, 900,099 whatever uh, would end up in you know Saturday Night Live probably. And I still don't know, and I hope that you agree with me, I, I don't feel we're there, um, and I still don't know how we didn't get there, you know? Because it's so easy. It's so easy to, to try to like find that essence um, but you find yourself on the other side of that invisible line where you know, you're outside of the character. And I think if, if anything, and that's, all, that's also why I genuinely think that you know, Donald's team, they should wait before they watch the movie, before they start suing us, because I think once you're inside that character, it feels different, you know? and we're inside that character. Great. Question on the right. <coughs> yeah, madame. Hello, Nana from uh, Danish new newspaper Politiken, uh, Ali Abbasi. Why did you, as a Danish Iranian filmmaker, decide to make such a partisan um, contribution to the American election right now? Partisan? I mean, um, look. Uh, I have to say one thing to start with. Um, I don't want to compare in kind, but 
you know, when uh, my big idol, Luis Buñuel, uh, would come here, people wouldn't say, oh, this Spanish filmmaker born, lived in Mexico, did a French movie. It's like, Luis Buñuel is here, you know? And I'm like, uh, Ali Abbas is here, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I think in that way, next time I'm going to go to Japan, you know? It's like... Uh, <laughs> and I... He's up there. Uh, it's not to compare, but my point being that I don't think that for me there is a there is a linear journey to okay, let's address things in Iran and then in Denmark, and now it went well. Now go abroad, you know. But uh, at least for me, and I think you touched upon it a little bit, uh, and I you know spoke about it a little bit last night. I think that in the past, you know, five, six years or, you know, some years, uh, my optimism about the world has faded. Um, you know, the, my optimism about, oh, we're going to, against all odds, uh, uh, be able to, uh, you know, whatever, like accomplish the humanistic project and whatnot. And, and I... I've been increasingly frustrated by my colleagues, by myself, because I feel like we're like, you know, becoming too, you know, navel gazing, you know, and and we're becoming too like inward looking, and and like I said, it's it's safer, it's nice, it feels better to to you know push out those distractions and say like those wars and political debates and stuff. They come and go, and the corrupt politicians come and go, and they don't concern me, but they do concern us. You know, they do concern us, and when we go out, there is a um, vacuum there, which is, you know, uh, you know, which is uh, filled by, uh, you know, Chinese government uh, propaganda movies, Iranian government propaganda movies, or Pentagon entertainment arm. You know what I mean? It, it, it's and and it's messy. It's not. Uh, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, the, the art with the big A, the way I want it, which was my playing field. So now I'm playing in their playing field. But I do think it's important that someone does it, you know, and, and I hope that someone else does it too, you know. Hello, it's uh, Yanis Rauzos from Greece, from my film .gr. Uh I'd like to address a question about the general pressures that you faced behind the curtains. At the moment now, we have uh, a strong political uh, situation that brings a new election in the US. And this kind of film must create a great pressure on you. And also, I would like to know about the role of photography in your film. You changed the format of photography from the 70s to 80s and 90s. Does it have to do with all the thing with the characters changing? But I would definitely like to hear about the role of photography. And Mr. Donovan, mm. how much this esoteric approach on your role uh, was uh, a general uh, choice of you, the, the dramatic, uh, silent almost approach on your role? Thank you. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I, uh, um, I, I worked, you know, um, I watched, the, I, saw, I found the video, because there's very little video of him being interviewed, but there was that one speech I found. So I worked on that, but honestly, um, I was not born into his class, but I know I was raised around people who think like him. And um, I, I've, we did a lot of improv, and it didn't make it into the film, but I did a lot of um, riffing where I was channeling the people I knew growing up. And I know how, the, I know the terminology they use. I know, um, I, I was around racists, you know? I know, I know how those people think. And um, so it was, it was, I was really channeling a lot of people I grew up with around. Um, and it actually was frighteningly easy to access. Um, so, um, you know, I see Fred as a, um, 
not a one-off um, in terms of his views. I think he's, it, it, his whole worldview is endemic to uh, you know, the white ruling class, basically, uh, around the world. I mean, that's, that's how those people view the world. And um, so that's really, you know, I, I hope that answers your question. I'll just jump in real quick on the, the pressures of making this film because, um, you know, when I first came up with the idea for the film seven years ago, you know, I heard so many voices in Hollywood from powerful people saying, oh, you know, this movie will never be made or who wants to watch a, a movie about Donald Trump? And, um, you know, it took a, a fearless producer and Amy who saw the potential of this idea and, and commissioned the script and then a brave artist like Ali to come on to, to, to direct and develop the movie. And, you know, it takes those people who are kind of fearless and a little bit crazy to do the thing that everybody says you shouldn't be doing. I had, you know, a very powerful uh, uh, Hollywood executive say, well, you know, if Trump loses, you know, maybe we'll, we'll think about it. You know, it's, I think if people talk about Hollywood being this quote, liberal place, but it's actually, you know, making a film like this is, is very challenging because Hollywood in, in many ways doesn't want to rock certain boats. And so um, I just feel so lucky to, you know, get to, to write something and then find people you know, brave enough to actually want to go do it. And I just want to point out that Hollywood didn't make this movie. It's yeah. actually <laughs> yeah. a co-production between Canada, yes. exactly. Denmark, you know, we couldn't and make Ireland. This system. Like, we couldn't make it in uh, the American system. Yeah, I mean, no matter what WGA thinks, it's not an American movie. <laughs> it's not. Ali, you want to say something? No. And Ali, the question about the look of the film, the changing look of the film. Oh, um, yeah, so last night at uh, 4.30, I was in my bed reading some of the reviews, and someone said, like, it looks like a shitty TV movie. And, and I was like, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the idea, actually, um, because, you know, we were, uh, you know, from the beginning, very interested in embedding the archival footage from the time. And, you know, the concept of reality in, in movies is so complicated, uh, yet often it's being always so flattened. And I think now, finally, I don't know, in maybe in the past 20 years, we have a real debate about what's real, what's not, in a very extreme way with, you know, deep fake and whatnot. But the language of reality, you know, as we know it, as we knew it, actually came from those archival footage. You know, they came from the way they would shoot the, the, the newsreels in the 70s and the, you know, the, the, the 80s where, you know, things got a bit more digital and mechanical and sharp. And also, I think there, there, is, a, there is a sort of a story development that makes sense for us because like the first half of the, the movie, Donald is in learning, things are in a way bright or, or you know, the, the trajectory upwards. You know, this is a, this is the same like inverted V shape that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson and uh, Stanley Kubrick use as well. You know, it's this up and then down, and the up is 70s and it's shot on 16 and it's grainy and feels good, and then the down is on video and it feels shitty and it should should be that. <laughs> and and a lot of that that look. We have a question on the right. Um, here, <coughs> oh. my name is Hossam Fahmi, I'm from a critic from Egypt. I uh, have two parts of the question. First for Sebastian, maybe you can tell us more how you play Donald Trump without sound like like Saturday Night Live character, two character, like how you, you would be able to do it in a more humanistic way. And for Ali, uh, like many people in the world are also pessimistic about the present and the future of the world like you. Do you think you would be able one day, or you would like to do one day also a movie about the minister's evil side also of Joe Biden or not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but the last part of your question? Like, would you like to do one day a movie about the evil side of Joe Biden also or not? Mm. <laughs> you can cast mm. Martin. <laughs> 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 When? If you want, if you want to play Joe Biden, oh me, oh yeah, the evil side of Joe you, Biden. You asked me that. <laughs> no, oh, I just volunteered you, but oh, thank you. Um, I'm not old enough. <laughs> I mean, um, 
Uh-oh. Well, uh, well, you know, it's, it started with the script, and, and that's what was fascinating, was, was reading the script, and, and for me, uh, you know, I, so much that I didn't know, and so much that I uh, was surprised by uh, when I first read it in terms of the journey, and of course, you know, there's an elephant in the room in your head about the person you, you think you know or you've seen, and, um, but once you got beyond that, um, you know, just going back to the beginning and, and trying to trace things back to the military academy and, and, and sort of how he grew up, uh, a lot of things seem to make sense. You know, uh, it, it, I, I'm happy actually you asked that question because, you know, I can clarify on something. You know, this is really not a movie about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. This is a movie about a system. It's a movie about a system and the way the system works and the way system is built and the way the power runs through the system. And then, um, you know, Roy Cohn, he was an expert in using that system, utilizing that system, and, you know, he taught Donald Trump. Uh, there are many other people, you know, you know, it would be a, a, you know, my life would not allow me to, you know, do biopics of every single one of them. But also, I think it's important to to look at it this way. You know, this whole, at least seeing from my side, you know, from my, like the Iranian side, or whatever you would call it, the idea that there is a very uh, sharp divide in the United States between conservatives and liberals, I think it's a fantasy. You know, I think a lot of these people, they go to the same uh, charity events, they go to the same galas, they want to the same schools. You know, they're, they're you know, it's like, uh, suffice to say, the guy who, who uh, created MSNBC in 1993 created Fox News in 1996. That's, that's, the, that's the, the, the structure you're dealing with, and, and you know, I think uh, Kurt Vonnegut said it very well, you know, there are two parties in the United States, the parties of winners and the party of losers. So I don't think we need to do a movie about every winner and every loser, you know, but y there you have one. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm afraid our time is up. Thank you for the film. Thank you.